Hello everyone, greetings in the name of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God has put this on my heart, so I have to share it with you. As always, please listen to the words and not the way it's delivered, and God will do the rest. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my Rock and my Redeemer. Amen. Here's one thing we have to be aware of, some ministers or preachers use the Bible, God's Word, like seasoning, MSG or salt and pepper, to spice up the Word to make it something it's not, something that they're doing the right thing, instead of giving God's Word and explaining it to God's people. Most people come to church on a superficial level in terms of their understanding of God. Pastors and ministers' jobs are to take them from where they are and help them grow and mature to a more excellent spiritual maturity. If every time they come to church, they hear a maximum of only one, or maybe two scriptures in 30 to 45 minutes, or maybe an hour. Sermons will not be sufficient if all they're getting every week to teach from a pastor to grow them spiritually. The thing about some preachers, they seldom preach against sin. Now, the Bible says that we should preach the word in season and out of season, which means, whether it's popular or whether it's not whether people want to hear it or whether they don't, whether it offends them or whether it doesn't, whether it brings to them to the point of tears and conviction and guilt or whether it does not. We are supposed to preach the entire word of God. Think about it. Pastors and ministers should preach the word, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, regardless of popularity. I thank God that I am blessed to have a pastor that speaks and teaches the truth regardless. Let's take a look at some of our world leaders in Christianity. Pope Francis has been getting a lot of attention lately because of some remarks that he made about civil unions between same-sex couples, midway through a documentary film called Francesco, which was premiered at the Rome Film Festival on October the 21st. Pope Francis said, Homosexual people have the right to be in a family, they are children of God, you can't kick someone out of a family, nor make their life miserable. This is why we need to have a civil union law that way they are legally covered. Pope Francis's statement about a civil union law for same-sex couples shocked the world. This is the first time a pope has publicly endorsed civil unions. Being a Christian leader, should the Pope comment on rights, or claim, that homosexuals are children of God, and should Christian religious leaders endorse civil unions for same-sex couples? Now, what does the Bible say about this? First, let's address if we all are children of God, Pope Francis said, we are all children of God, including homosexuals, the answer to this question is yes, and no, we are all children of God in a creative sense because God created us since he is the creator of the universe, but, we are not all children of God in a personal sense, and what that means is not everyone has a close personal relationship with God like a father with a son or daughter, for example, in St. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, Still, as many, as received him talking about Jesus to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Still, someone might say there are gay believers in Jesus Christ as well, however, the belief that John chapter 1 verse 12 is talking about is not a simple acknowledgement of God, because James chapter 2 verse 17 says, faith without works is dead, so, works of obedience to God demonstrate the belief or faith in God, that leads to someone becoming a child of God, this is confirmed by Romans chapter 8 verse 14, which says for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, the Holy Spirit is not going to lead lead us to do something contrary to God's will, which includes homosexuality, about homosexuality, Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22 says, you shall not lie with a male, as with a woman, it is an abomination is especially offensive to God. So, God disapproves of gay acts, and those who continue to commit such acts are making themselves slaves of sin and children of the devil, Satan. For example, in John chapter 8 34, Jesus said most assuredly, I say to you, whoever sins is a slave of sin. 1 John chapter 3 verse 10 says, In this the children of God, the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor does he love his brother. Practicing righteousness means doing what's right. Those who do wrong, which includes living a gay lifestyle, make themselves children of the devil. 
So, Pope Francis is playing it very loosely with the phrase children of God, when claiming that everyone is a child of God in the same sense. But before I continue, I want to make something clear. In my research, I see, God loves gay people too. St. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world which includes gay people, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, the Bible condemns homosexual acts, and people living a queer lifestyle aren't children of God, in the same sense that Christians who live according to the Bible are, but that doesn't take away from God's love. For homosexual people, God loves gay people, and he wants them to be saved. He wants them to repent from their gay lifestyle. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, and it is possible to repent from living a homosexual lifestyle. Society tells us it's not possible it tells us that being homosexual is not a choice. It tells us that people who are born gay can do nothing about it. But I'm here to tell you that you do have a choice if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He can give you the power to help you overcome your perverted sexual desires. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 through 12 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Be deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor homosexuals nor sodomites nor thieves nor covetous, nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now here's the good news, and such were some of you, what does that mean? They were homosexuals, but they're not gay anymore, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. By the Spirit of our God, now that I have dealt with whether or not we are all children of God. The Bible says about homosexuality, I am going to discuss whether Christian leaders should endure civil unions for same-sex couples. I don't think they should, I think Christian leaders should avoid endorsing any sexually immoral unions. Yes, you should love and respect gay people, and treat them how you want to be treated, but endorsing same-sex unions makes it seem like you approve of them, and that's a compromise we can't afford. Souls will be lost if we do that. We need to tell people in the LGBTQ plus community that there is a danger if they continue living that kind of lifestyle. It's sinful, and the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. They will be eternally lost, and their blood will be on our hands if we neglect our duty to warn them. Ezekiel chapter 3 verses 17 through 19 tells us, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel, therefore hear a word from my mouth. And give them warning from me when I say to the wicked, You shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. Still, his blood I would require at your hand, yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So you won't think that I am picking on homosexuals or the LGBTQ I will repeat this, so that you will see this a little clearer, hopefully. 1 Corinthians 6 9-10 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. There is a tendency to look at homosexuality as the worst of all sins. While it is undeniable, biblically speaking, homosexuality is immoral and unnatural, Romans 1 26-27, in no sense does the Bible describe homosexuality as an unforgivable sin. Nor does the Bible teach that homosexuality is a sin Christians will never struggle with. Maybe that is the crucial phrase in the question of whether it is possible to be a gay Christian. Struggle against. A Christian can struggle with homosexual temptations. Many homosexuals who become Christians have ongoing struggles with gay feelings and desires. Some strongly heterosexual men and women have experienced a spark of homosexual interest at some point in their lives. Whether or not these desires and temptations exist does not determine whether a person is a Christian. The Bible is clear that no Christian is sinless, 1 John 1 8 10. While the specific sin and temptation varies from one Christian to another, all Christians have struggled with evil, and all Christians sometimes fail in those struggles, 1 Corinthians 10 13. The difference between a Christian's life from a non-Christian's life is the struggle against sin. 
the Christian life is a progressive journey of overcoming the acts of the flesh, Galatians 5 19-21, and allowing God's Spirit to produce the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5 22-23. Yes, Christians sin, sometimes horribly. Sadly, sometimes Christians are indistinguishable from non-Christians. However, a true Christian will always repent, always eventually return to God, and always resume the struggle against sin. But the Bible gives no support for the idea that a person who perpetually and unrepentantly engages in sin can indeed be a Christian. Notice 1 Corinthians 6:11, and that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6 9-10 lists sins that, if indulged in continuously, identify a person as not being redeemed not being a Christian. Often, homosexuality is singled out from this list. If a person struggles with homosexual temptations, that person is presumed to be unsaved. If a person actually engages in homosexual acts, that person is definitely thought to be unsaved. However, the same assumptions are not made, at least not with the same emphasis, regarding other sins in the list. Fornication, premarital sex, idolatry, adultery, thievery, covetousness, alcoholism, slander, and deceit. I have to say that again fornication, premarital sex, idolatry, adultery, thievery, covetousness, alcoholism, slander, and deceit. For example, it is inconsistent to declare those guilty of premarital sex as disobedient Christians, while declaring homosexuals definitively non-Christians. Is it possible to be a gay Christian? If the phrase gay Christian refers to a person who struggles against homosexual desires and temptations yes, a gay Christian is possible. However, the description gay Christian is not accurate for such a person since he or she does not desire to be gay and struggles against the temptations. Such a person is not a gay Christian, but rather is simply a struggling Christian, just as Christians struggle with fornication, lying, and stealing. Suppose the phrase gay Christian refers to a person who actively, perpetually, and unrepentantly lives a homosexual lifestyle no. In that case, it is not possible for such a person to indeed be a Christian. Here is my testimony or the subject of homosexuality in my life. At seven or eight years of age, I wanted to be a girl, and at one time thought I was a girl. Sometimes later in life, I thought about this, how could this be? What is the reason I was feeling like that? I talked with God, I asked him why did I feel like this? And he revealed this to me. At that time, I was the oldest of five. I had four siblings, three sisters and one brother. My father was treating my sisters differently than he treated my brother and me. He told my sisters that he loved them, my father kissed and hugged them too. So it seemed to me at that time, I wanted him to treat me the same. You see, in those days, a father did not treat his sons the same way he treated his daughters for fear that they would make them gay. Believe it or not, this is another way the enemy tries to infiltrate your mind with confusion. He is the father of lies. Think about it. Now, think about this, your eyes and ears, and sometimes your nose, are gates to your mind. It would be best if you guarded these gates at all costs, but you can't do that by yourself. This is where you need God. Would you like to know how? I'm glad you asked, this is a one-stop shop. Here is how but first, let me ask you a few questions. Here's how you can get your reservation and your invitation to be saved and go to heaven when your life on earth is over. This is for your peace. Hear why you on earth and life everlasting when you leave to go to heaven. Are you saved? Are you going to heaven? The Bible says that if salvation were based on our efforts, no one could be saved. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Psalm 143 2 adds, No one living is righteous before you. Romans 3.10 affirms, There is no one righteous, not even one. We cannot save ourselves. Instead, we are saved when we believe in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.8.9 teaches, It is by grace you have been saved, through faith and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. God's grace saves us, and grace, by definition, cannot be earned. We do not deserve salvation, we receive it by faith. God's grace is enough to cover all sin, Romans 5.20. The Bible is filled with examples of people who were saved from sinful backgrounds. 
The Apostle Paul wrote to Christians who had formerly been living in various wicked conditions, including sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, homosexuality, thievery, greed, and drunkenness. But Paul tells them that, upon salvation, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God, 1 Corinthians 6 9 11. The Apostle Paul himself had been a persecutor of Christians, approving of Stephen's death, Acts 8 1, and arresting Christians and throwing them into prison, Acts 8 3. He would later write, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst, 1 Timothy 1 13, 15. God often chooses to save unlikely candidates to serve his purposes. He saved a thief on a cross with only minutes to live, Luke 23 42 43, a persecutor of the church, Paul, a fisherman who had denied him, Peter, a Roman soldier and his family, Acts 10, a runaway slave, Onesimus and Philemon, James E. Jones Sr. Danny, a womanizer and a drunkard, James E. Jones Jr. J, a womanizer, a drunkard and a killer and many others. There is no one beyond God's ability to save, see Isaiah 52. We must respond in faith and receive his free gift of eternal life. Who can be saved? One thing is for sure you can, if you receive Jesus Christ as your savior. If you are not sure you have accepted Jesus as your savior, you can respond right now with a prayer similar to this. God, I realize I am a sinner and could never reach heaven by my good deeds. Right now, I place my faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son, who died for my sins and rose from the dead to give me eternal life. Please forgive me of my sins and help me to live for you. Thank you for accepting me and giving me eternal life. Have you, in faith, just received Jesus Christ as your Savior because of what you heard here? You now have help guarding those gates, and you now have your reservation for heaven. Praise God, hallelujah, praise God. Now join me as I pray, Heavenly Father, all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise belongs to you. I would like to thank you for your goodness, you are a sovereign Lord, and you are a good God, your covenant is trustworthy. Lord and all the things that you have promised to us as your children you will fulfill and Lord, I know that as long as my eyes are fixed on you King Jesus, then I know that I can weather any storm that comes my way, I know as long as I am fixed on you Lord, I can overcome anything that tries to hinder me. With my eyes fixed on you, I will not drown in deep waters, I will not be burnt in the fire, so today, I ask that you turn your face towards me and give me peace. I thank you that in your word you have called me loved you have called me friend, and that's despite my past, despite my mistakes, you have loved me with open arms you have loved me despite my weaknesses and my flaws, and in your love Lord I know that every single one of my desires is satisfied thank you for the assurance that you will never abandon me, you will never forsake me or turn your back on me. I refuse to let the devil steal my joy and strengthen the Lord. I refuse to let the devil distract me from you Lord, and so I pray Holy Spirit, give me the presence of mind convict my heart, always to be alert and vigilant, so that I may not be, swayed by the distractions of this world, and Lord, I want to thank you, Father, that all things work together for good for those that love you, and are fitting into your plans and purposes, Lord we look to you for direction in unknown areas, and, in uncertain areas, we look to you Father. I pray today that the Holy Spirit may speak to me and make your will clear to me. May the Holy Spirit reveal your will for my life Lord, so that I may walk in my true kingdom purpose. Father God, show me the path that leads to righteousness. From your word, I take comfort in knowing that you are looking out for me. You are the God who maintains my peace, the God who gives me strength. You are the one who prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. You are the one that fills my cup with blessings. You, Lord Jesus, are the one that anoints my head, and you alone are my inheritance. Oh, I am grateful, Father God, for all of your goodness towards me, and even sometimes, when I fall short sometimes, when I stumble and fall, when I get scared or nervous thinking about the future or the unknown. I pray that you forgive me, Lord Jesus, and I pray that you strengthen my faith, so that I may not worry 
worry about all of these various areas, and so, that I may not worry about all of these things that I do not control. I pray that you strengthen my faith, so that I may leave it in your hands, so that I may leave my cares and burdens in your hands, Lord Jesus, may I forever be covered by your blood your blood that still has power today. May I permanently be protected against the devil's attacks. May I forever be hidden from the sight of the enemy. I declare that only you, Lord Jesus, have the throne to my heart. You will always be first in my life, and I ask the Holy Spirit that you help me to keep my heart guarded against any idols that may try and take the place of God in my life. Help me, Holy Spirit, to be protected against idols that demand my attention and my priorities. May I always put the Lord first in my life, and Father I thank you that I am established I am anointed, and I am sealed by the Holy Spirit for your word in Colossians 2 verse 10. Tells me that in Christ you have been brought to fullness you are the head over every power and authority, so I declare that I am made whole in Christ, I have been brought to fullness in Jesus Christ, I am complete lacking nothing because my God and my Savior is the head of every power and authority on heaven and on earth, because of you Lord, because of the price you paid on the cross I am now set apart as a child of God, you have distinguished me. And so, I thank you, for I have been bought with a price your precious blood, a price that is worth more than any jewel or diamond that can be found on this earth. Your word reminds me in 1 Corinthians 6:19, and it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bored at a price. And so Lord, I submit to the Holy Spirit, I submit my body to be the temple of the Holy Ghost. I am grateful that your word tells me that I am not my own, and that I have been purchased by the blood of the precious Lamb of God, a Lamb without blemish and without spot. I thank you Father for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen.